And that flooding has increasingly become a problem as the climate crisis worsens across the country. In Detroit, though, it doesn't affect all neighborhoods equally. The remnants of old waterways can intensify the issue in some areas. Joining me now to talk about it is Jacob Napieralski, a lead author on a study that looks into the city's buried waterways. He's also a professor of geology at U of M Dearborn. Thank you for being here today. Oh, thank you very much for having me, especially on a day with floods. Yeah, kind of prime time for you. So these are sometimes called ghost streams. For those who don't know, can you just explain the concept? What is that? Sure. These are rivers, and we studied wetlands as well. These are rivers and wetlands that used to be in the system that were part of the landscape that we've removed due to development. And so the remnants are still there, but we've probably buried on top of them. And we're talking about a significant number, right? This isn't just a few. Yeah, so there, Michigan was a pretty water rich state. And so in order for us to develop and build Metro Detroit, we had to remove a lot of these waterways because uh, floods are normal. Uh, wetlands are always wet and this can be seen as inconvenient for a lot of people. So as part of that early development, we devalued rivers, we removed them from the landscape and there's quite a few. So the city of Detroit, I think they've lost about 85, 86% of their uh, rivers since 1905. And they, they had lost rivers well before that as well. So. Detroit is pretty much devoid of rivers, but they had a lot in the old days. So how does this impact what we're dealing with now? When you bury streams and rivers, what's the long-term impact on the city that sits on top of those areas? Good question. So a lot of times when we bury these rivers, the, the remnants are still there. There's still a very subtle stream valley. So if we have a lot of concrete, water has no place to go. That ends up collecting in these structures, even if there is no river or no wetlands. So I, I like to bring up like Jefferson Chalmers neighborhood. Just that's that's a buried wetlands that was a drained wetlands, and then we built on top of it. The byproduct of that is you have an environment that's really low lying and collects a lot of water, and so a lot of residents end up with flooded basements. Yeah, and all residents, all neighborhoods aren't exactly dealing with an equal amount of risk. Can you talk about the intersection between redlining and these buried ghost streams? Yeah, so we were very interested in history and we wanted to know history of landscape, but we also wanted to know history of, of what we did with communities and neighborhoods. And so sort of that redlining process that's 70, 80 years old, uh, we wanted to see if the remnants of that still exist. And so there's been a number of studies that show communities that were scored poorly, in other words, bad investments for bankers and lenders, very difficult for residents to get loans. These are communities that you know, right now, if you live in one of those, even though it's outdated, if you live in one of those, chances are you have a higher risk for public health, environmental health issues. If you live in a really good neighborhood that was scored an A, your flood risk tends to be lower, your urban heat tends to be lower. So there is a, a significant disparity between those. And again, a lot of these communities might be low income communities that are struggling but also communities that don't speak English as a first language. And so I think it's a, something that we need to do to reach some of these people is to speak their language, break it down for them and get them to be informed citizens. Yeah. Is there a resource? Is there somewhere someone can look at a map and see where these buried streams are? I'm working on that. So that's something that we would really like to have uh, access for the general public so that they can go find out, do I live on an old river? So right now we're, we're digitizing and, and trying to create maps that provide some information and connect it to flood risks so that residents would be able to look at their parcel of land and find out, do I live on a buried wetlands and what is my flood risk? Yeah, and you know, educating people about this, letting them know what's going on, what's the end goal? What do you think that can lead to? Is it just avoiding settling down in that area or are there other steps people can take? Well, I, I think there are lots of things. Um, you know, this is a pretty significant problem in the US, not just Detroit. And so it's something that, um, you know, even in the Great Lakes Basin, there's a lot of effort to try to minimize or at least mitigate some of the flood uh, problems that we have. But in a city like uh, Detroit, it's an old city with a very old water infrastructure, both water that goes to the houses, but how we manage stormwater and uh, updating that's really expensive. So a lot of times residents end up having to invest in pumps to pump water out of their basements. But they can also be very proactive, disconnect their downspout from the stormwater system, building rain gardens, trying to capture some of this water so that they actually store it. And then when we get those really hot days and we have no water, things start to dry up. They have some water that they can use that's fresh off of a, a rain barrel that they capture themselves. But anything that residents can do to sort of keep water from going into the stormwater system is a really good first step.
Sure. And we're already seeing some of these inequities now. But going forward, we know that uh, vulnerable communities are disproportionately impacted by climate change. As we start to continue to see intensified impacts from climate change, what do you think the risk is for these areas that were historically redlined? So there, there are a number of studies that show that it's just it's getting more difficult. Uh, the difference in, in urban heat, for example, if you live in a, a community that was redlined, so it was scored as a D, a very high risk place 80 years ago, those communities now ha tend to have a seven, eight degree Fahrenheit temperature difference than A communities. So it's a substantial difference. And the problem is that requires people to use more air conditioning, more energy, and that may be money that they don't have. On the other hand, you look at some of these communities that are wet, and so they flood very frequently. Flood insurance can be expensive. If you live in an affluent community, it's a, an investment that's worth it for you. But for people who are struggling to get by, live paycheck to paycheck, flood insurance, if it's not mandatory, it's something that they might pass on. Yeah, it's really crazy to think about. You're literally dealing with different weather in a disadvantaged area. Uh, a lot of times we've heard that Michigan is considered a climate safe haven, kind of safer from some of the impacts of climate change than many other areas of the country. Would you include the Detroit area in that? I think if you go up to the subarctic or Arctic, you'll see the impact of climate change is right up in front of your face. You see it. It's substantial. If you go down to some of the coastal areas, you see the impact of intensifying storms and sea level rising. So in the Great Lakes Basin, we tend to see ourselves as somewhat insulated, but it doesn't mean that we are safe. So projections going forward to the end of the century, we should expect to get two to three more inches of rain per year than we do now. And we should expect to see temperatures being somewhere around four to seven to eight degrees Fahrenheit warmer than they are now. So we should expect to see Things get a little bit more difficult, but again, my concern is those low income neighborhoods, they're the ones that are going to struggle the most. Um, it's much more easy for a community that's very green and very lush to kind of get past those hot temperatures. But those that don't have much, it, it becomes a big struggle. So I think there are some concerns, even though we're insulated a, a little bit, it's not as significant. There's still going to be problems going forward. Yeah. Incredibly concerning. Uh, Jacob Naparowski from the University of Michigan, thank you for the work you're doing, and we will keep an eye out for that Ghost Stream map. Excellent. Thank you very much for having me. Appreciate it.